and uh, at this point the government has closed them in they can only leave their homes every other week but uh, in finding this they have worked uh, very diligently and uh, we from the Blacksburg have uh, furnished funds where they can buy food uh, our brother Francisco who preaches at uh, Talanga Honduras is also a medical doctor and uh, he has done a great deal of research and work okay who are the ones who have great needs what about the elderly what do they need the widows the families with many children the ones with uh, particular uh, problems and so uh, they are processing and providing food delivering food every two weeks according to the needs of the people and so we greatly appreciate the fact that we can have a part in helping them feed the hungry. Leonel, Jairo, and Harold in Ocotal and Santa Clara, Nicaragua are doing the same thing, but they write that uh, because the government is socialistic, they do not receive much information, but uh, the needs are great as far as uh, people in hunger, and uh, we are able to provide that, so let us pray at this time. God, we thank you that we have opportunity to help our brothers and sisters, and we do pray for them. We know some of them are in such dire needs and the kind of hunger that we know nothing about here in the United States. We ask that they will be blessed. Uh, children with malnutrition, can we provide what is necessary so that they can overcome this? We are grateful, God, that we have this privilege, and as we receive it, information in the letters from there uh, they write that God gets the praise and so we give you the praise for all of this we pray in the name of Christ amen How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness 
Corinthians 15, if you'd like to turn there, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life alone, we are of all people most to be pitied. I've struggled with the phrase, that if um, Christ had not been resurrected, then our faith was pointless before. Couldn't we have hope anyway without that? Is it not possible to? I couldn't see sometimes you know, why the resting was so critical, or I just have to admit that. It's, it's been a challenge uh, in the past. I mean, I knew that it was important, but I didn't invalidate our faith if it didn't happen. But there's been a lot of recent study that I've done that has helped, you know, encourage and strengthen my understanding. We find that through many scriptures in the Bible, references of why death happens and why the resurrection is needed. Specifically, there's a lot of talk about sin and how it leads to death. It even starts off the Bible. In Genesis 3, it's part of the fall. We learn that uh, Adam is sentenced. It says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In Romans 12, or sorry, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Romans 6, 23 sums it up the best. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So death is the result of sin. Resurrection is the overcoming of that. Back over to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
For God has put all things into subjection under his feet. So without the resurrection, Christ wouldn't have overcome death, which means Christ wouldn't have overcome sin. There's a couple of other things that have been recently pointed out to me uh, through actually a book that I was reading uh, from N.T. Wright, where he points out that before Jesus, the cross was the raw and absolute power of Rome. The cross represented their ability to control everything. After Jesus, that symbol of the cross was no longer the representation of the power of Rome, but it was now the sign of hope. And we wear it today in necklaces, and we see it everywhere as a sign of hope. Through the cross, God showed that even the most horrible thing could be redeemed and made into something amazing. A completely new hope. And Christ has removed all the horror of the world through the resurrection and opened the door to something amazing. Through the resurrection, we're called not to see death, but to see life. It's the overcoming of death. And I think there's a, a, a quote that I'd like to read that it's a little bit lengthy, and I apologize for reading so many quotes, but I felt it summed up kind of how all this fits together quite well. And so this is actually from the last page of uh, N.T. Wright's book, Simply Christian. The way to make sense of it all is to look ahead. Look to the coming time when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge and glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and then live in the present in the light of that promise. Sure that it will come fully true because it was already fulfilled when God did for Jesus at Easter what he's going to do for the whole creation. When you see the dawn breaking, you think back to the darkness in a new way. Sin is not simply the breaking of a law. It is the missing of an opportunity. Having heard the echoes of a voice, we are called to come and meet the speaker. We are invited to be transformed by the voice itself. In the word of the gospel, the word which declares that evil has been judged, that the world has been put to rights, that earth and heaven are joined forever, and that new creation has begun. We are called to become people who can speak and live and paint and sing that word so that those who have heard its echoes can come and lend a hand in the larger project. That is the opportunity that stands before us as gift and possibility. Christian holiness is not as people often imagine, a matter of denying something good. It's about growing up and grasping something even better. Made for spirituality, we wallow in introspection. Made for joy, we settle for pleasure. Made for justice, we clamor for vengeance. Made for relationship, we insist on our own way. Made for beauty, we are satisfied with sentiment. But new creation has already begun. The sun has begun to rise. Christians are called to leave behind in the tomb of Jesus Christ all that belongs to the brokenness and incompleteness of the present world. It is time, in the power of the Spirit, to take up our proper role, our fully human role as agents, heralds, and stewards of the new day that is dawning. That, quite simply, is what it means to be Christian, to follow Jesus Christ into the world, God's new world, which he has thrown open before us. So through the resurrection, we have that hope of the new world that's already starting now. So bow with me as I bless the bread and the fruit of the vine together and as you partake of communion at home. Father, we're so thankful for the wonderful gift that you gave us through Jesus. We're also thankful for that sacrifice, as horrible as it was, because of the joy and the hope that it brings. Thankful for the understanding that resurrection after the sacrifice represents the overcoming of death, the overcoming of sin, the overcoming of this world. And it brings everything together into perfect focus. And that focus is on you. Father, I pray that you'll watch over this church family as we commune together, even remotely. And that we will keep our hearts and minds set on things above. And we will remember the covenant you made to us and always seek you in everything that we do. In your Son, Jesus the Christ's name, amen.
to our moms who are, are not with us. We love you and we wish that we could be with you today. There was a young man who was walking through a supermarket. He was just picking up a few things and he noticed a little old lady following him around. And he didn't really think too much of it. It was strange, but he continued his shopping. When he was finally done, he, he headed to the checkout line and strangely enough, she rushed in front of him to get in line. And she said to him, pardon me, Sonny, I'm sorry if my staring at you has, has made you a little uncomfortable. It's just that you, you look so much like my son and I haven't seen him in a long time. Oh, well, that's a shame, replied the young man. Is there anything I can do to, to help you? Yes, she said, as I'm leaving, can you say goodbye, mother? It would make me feel so much better. Well, sure, answered the young man. He thought that was strange, but if that'll help, sure. And so as the old woman was leaving, he sweetly called out, Goodbye, mother. And she even blew a kiss to him. But as he stepped back to the checkout counter, he saw that his total showed $127.50. And he said, How can this be? I, I, only, I only purchased a few things, he asked the clerk. But the clerk said, Oh, well, your sweet mother said that you'd take care of her bill for her. Right, so <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Now, all jokes aside, we love our mothers. And we know none of our moms would ever do something as devious as that. But if you did, we'd probably let you get away with it. I really want to make sure that, that, that all of the women out there who have added to the mothering or the raising or even the disciplining of children, whether they were your own children or somebody else's children, I, I want you to know how much you're appreciated. I want you to know that you're dearly loved. I've seen so many amazing mothers who are incredibly selfless when it comes to children, sometimes even if it's not their own children. A and what you do, mothers and women who, who, who are there mothering us, what, what you do adds so much to the kingdom of God and it's amazing that you're able to do it. Now this morning, we're talking about a great mom straight out of scripture. Her name is Hannah. And she is held up by God as an example, somebody to learn from, a mother that we can admire. But immediately as we're introduced to Hannah in the, in the scriptures, we find that she has a problem. She can't get pregnant. She can't become pregnant and she wants to. And why can't she become pregnant? Well, we're told very shortly in Scripture that God has closed up her womb. That's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. The Lord has closed her womb. But why has God done this? I mean, was, was God punishing Hannah? Did she do something against God, or was she a mean or a bad person? No, I don't, I don't think that's it at all. 
we don't get anything in scripture to indicate that she was wicked or, or evil in any way at all. In fact, the picture painted here is of a godly woman who's in trouble, a godly woman who's, who's hurting. She's heartbroken. And Hannah prays with all of her soul that God would help her. She prays fervently with all of her soul that God would help her. And that's not the kind of person that God is going to be looking to punish. That's not the kind of person God is punishing. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 was my dad's favorite scripture, and it's one of my favorite scriptures. It says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now that's Hannah. I mean, that's describing Hannah to a T. God wasn't punishing Hannah. God's eyes had ranged throughout the earth to find a woman just like Hannah. And his eyes focused on her because he knew Hannah could be a woman that he could raise to be one of the most influential and significant mothers in all of scripture and therefore in all of time. Now, back in the day, the setting at that time was that Israel was a nation in severe crisis. Judges chapter 17, verse 6, it tells us that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Everybody did whatever they felt like doing. And it wasn't a priest's sight. There was no common justice. There was no court system. The whole nation was becoming rotten. I mean, even Eli, the priest, and his two sons were not very nice people. His two sons were straight up corrupt. And so God needed to bring about an incredible change, a dramatic change. He needed to raise up a hero who could lead his people towards righteousness. He needed a man who could, could step up and, and do what needed to be done. He needed somebody who could become a judge, somebody who could become a prophet, somebody who could become a priest for God. And in order to train up that kind of leader for Israel, God was going to need the help of a very special kind of mother. And that's where Hannah fits in. Hannah was going to be not only a good mother, but a godly mother. And that's what all of us should aspire to be, a godly parent. If we are a parent, we shouldn't just want to be good or sufficient. We should want to be a godly parent. Hannah was the kind of woman that, that God could count on. He could count on her and he could work through her to raise up the person that he needed in order to shape and change his nation of Israel. But first, God had to bring her to a point. And this is, this is heavy. It's not so easy to, to wrap your mind around her. Not for me. He had to get Hannah to the point that she felt desperate enough that she's willing to do whatever it is that God needs her to do. You know, God, he takes us to places that we wouldn't always choose to go if it were just up to ourselves. C.S. Lewis once said, God whispers in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God had to get Hannah to the point where she felt desperate enough that was she was willing to do whatever God asked of her. And so in her pain, Hannah comes to a decision. She, she decides, if God will, will give me a son, she, she says this, if God will give me a son, I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. I will dedicate my son to the Lord if God blesses me with a son. Now, this gets a little technical here, but every firstborn son belonged to God anyway. All right, this has to do with the, the law of Moses. That's what it said in the law. In Exodus chapter 32, God told his people, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. So Hannah's firstborn son would have belonged to God from birth anyway. But just like all of the Israelites, she and her husband would have ordinarily, uh, really even, you could say, routinely, you could just assume 
that they would have redeemed their firstborn son. Now, again, this gets a little technical, but I'm going to read one more scripture to you to, to, to explain a little bit from Numbers chapter 18, verse 16. It tells the Israelites, when your son is a month old, you must redeem him at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver. Now, the whole idea here, and I'm not going to go deep into it, but the whole idea is that everything we have, everything that we are, belongs to God. And so he wants us to bring our first fruits, our firstborn to, to God. And then he's not asking us to put them in baskets and walk away. We, we, um, in the law of Moses, we could give five shekels of silver, which I have no idea how much that is. And then we could take our son home. That's how it was. We should have a whole other study about that topic sometime. But Hannah is vowing here. She's saying that, God, if you give me a son, I'll let you keep him. I won't redeem him back. I will dedicate his entire life to you. In her mind, she had already decided that, that if God blessed her with a son, she'd give him to the priests who served at the tabernacle. And her son's life would be dedicated to helping people worship God. Now, I think that's a beautiful aspect of Hannah's soul. She was willing to dedicate her son's life so that people could be assisted in their worship of God. Now, I don't know if she came up with this idea on her own, if, if it came to her by herself, if she had, had, had been suggested to her, or, or maybe God planted it as a seed in her heart. But, but either way, she came to this point in her life where she was willing to dedicate her son to God, and God was honored by that decision. And his kingdom was glorified by, by the choice that Hannah was making. And as Hannah's life continued, God blessed Hannah in some powerful ways. Because at this point in the story, I feel really bad for Hannah. She's, she's devoted, she's, she's heartbroken, she's promising whatever she can think of, but, but God blesses Hannah in some incredible ways. Not only does she get, she get pregnant right away, but she has three more sons, and best of all, she has two daughters after Samuel. We, we read that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. But it would only be in the years to come that she would fully realize what a thing it was to be the mother of Samuel. I mean, I'm sure she loved all of her children and was proud of all of them equally, but it became an enormous thing to be the mother of Samuel. And let me just tell you a few things about Samuel. He was one of the greatest men in the Old Testament time period, and therefore he's one of the greatest men who's ever lived. He was the last of the judges to rule over um, Israel, and he was the first in a long line of, of prophets through whom God spoke to his people. He was such a, a righteous man that he guided the people out of their immorality, where, where, where there, was, there was no judge and everybody did whatever they wanted to. He, he led them out of their immorality and back towards and obedience to God. And he was so highly regarded by God. Samuel, a person, a human person, was so highly regarded by God that not only are there two books named after him, but, but God several times compares Samuel's righteousness with the righteousness of Moses, which if there's a hall of fame when it comes to faith, they're right up there at the top. That's Samuel. That's Hannah's boy. That's, that's her son. That's the man who, who grew up because she was dedicated and because she prayed and because she was heartbroken before the Lord. I mean, Samuel provides Hannah some serious bragging rights, right? Imagine the typical mom that, that maybe you're sitting next to on a, a flight or on a bus or at a salon and, and she pulls out her wallet or her phone and she just starts showing you all these pictures of her, of her children and she's so proud of them and, and she's... she's she says stuff like, hey, this is, this, is my, this is my son, Johnny, and he's the Supreme Court Justice, and he cured cancer yesterday, and this is my daughter, and she does all these. That's what it would have been like to be the mother of Samuel. She had some serious bragging rights. She could think to her friends, she could say to her friends, this is my son. Look how big he made it. And this was all possible because Hannah was a godly woman who prayed, and she didn't care who noticed she didn't care if she looked silly. She didn't care if she looked foolish. In fact, Eli thought she was drunk. She was praying so fervently. Now, when God tells us about people like, like Hannah, 
here. There's, there's something he wants us to learn. There's a lesson. There's a reason we're being told all of these centuries later about these people. God wants us to learn. He wants us to see that, that Hannah is a, is a godly praying woman. He wants us to notice that she's, she's the kind of woman that God listens, listens to and that we, both men and, and women alike, we should all aspire to be like her. We should. We should aspire to be like Hannah. And so if you want your children to become people who make you proud, be like Hannah. If you want your children to be capable of making a difference in their world, then be like Hannah. If you want your children to grow up serving God with their lives, then be like Hannah. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? How can you and I be like Hannah? And I'm just going to tell you four brief ways that you and I can be like Hannah. And the first thing we need to do is we need to pray passionately. When we pray to God, let it be with feeling. Let it be with gusto. Do it with all your heart. Don't do it half-heartedly or don't do it as a, a routine or as some rote memorized um, uh, thing. Pray with zeal. The heart of this entire story that I'm telling you about is centers on Hannah's prayers. God is so impressed with, with how she prayed, the spirit that she had when she prayed, that he tells about us, he tells it to us about it in great detail. We're told that she prayed with tears, that she prayed with intensity, that she prayed with purpose, and she prayed believing that God could do what she was asking him to do. That's the way that we need to learn to pray. When we do, we're told in Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, if what you want is to, to find God, you're gonna find God. If what you want is to serve God and you come to him about that, he's gonna help you understand and see how to serve him. If you desire God, that's what you're going to get. So to be like Hannah, first we need to pray passionately. And secondly, we need to seek God's best for our children. God's best. Not the world's best or not the best that we can imagine or not the, the most expensive thing we can provide. We need to seek God's best. And those are very often not the same thing. So centuries before Christ prayed in the garden saying, not thy will, but, but thine, she was already, Hannah was already displaying that kind of spirit. She does this because she's convinced that, that God's best is the best. That God's best is the best. And there's nothing better that she can supply to her children. There's no future she can secure better than what God can do for her child. This is the kind of woman whose greatest dream for her children is that they be useful in God's kingdom. And they do that in whatever shape or fashion that God needs them. She's not, uh, she's not priest, priest prescribed what they need to do. I want to tell you, a few years back, somebody must have told my son Ezekiel that, that he should grow up to be a minister just like his dad. But Zeke came to me and he said, Dad, I don't want to be a preacher. And I told him, you don't have to be a preacher. In fact, maybe you should, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe don't. But I'd be proud of him if he did. I told him, maybe God wants to do something incredibly different with your life than he wanted to do with my life. And I've told him, and I've tried to tell my, my other children that, that I'd be incredibly proud of them as, as, long as, as long as they make sure that whatever they do, they do it completely for God. Whether that's as a teacher or a scientist or, or, or a minister or a lawyer or anything, if they do it completely for God, I'll be proud of whatever it is. And so the third thing that we got to do is this. We need to keep our word to God and to others. Making a vow should not be a small thing for us. God was able to trust Hannah with this wonderful baby boy because he knew that he could trust her to do what she said. We've got to be a people who do what we say. And as parents, whether mothers or fathers, we have to keep our word, keep our word to God, keep our word to our children. As soon as her boy Samuel was, was weaned, which I don't know how old he was, maybe 18 months, maybe 24 months, but as soon as he was weaned, she marched him to the tabernacle and she honored her word to God. But you know, she didn't, she didn't just leave him there, you know, like with, without ever looking back. 
She didn't put them in a basket and put a sign on there that said, please feed. No, no, no. We're told in Samuel chapter 2, 19, that, that each year his mother made him a little robe, which is adorable, right? To think about his mother making him a little robe. She made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her, to her, with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. And she may have seen him more often than just that one time of the year, but she saw him every time and, and brought him a new ephod, which was the official robe that a, a priest had to wear. And so when she visited with her son, what do you imagine? What do you think they talked about? What do you think she shared with him when she had a limited amount of time? Well, I imagine she told him about how God had sent him specifically to her, how he was special, how he was a child of destiny, that God had a purpose for him. And that brings me to the last thing that, that we should do if we aspire to be a godly parent, just like Hannah. And that is this, we need to emphasize to our kids how much God cares for them, how much he cares for them. Now, of course, God loves us. I mean, I think everybody knows that, or at least they've heard that. But in our language, our human uh, English language, love can be just an emotion. You know, we can talk about it very flippantly sometimes. God, God has loving emotion for us and for our kids, for sure. Uh, yeah, of course. But what he has for us is so much more than just mere emotion. God actively cares for our well-being. God is involved in our daily life. God is, is active in, in our lives right now. It's not just an emotion that's somewhere off in the distance. And so we need to look for ways to explain and describe to our children all that God has done. Not just that he loves us, but that he cares for us. And we should tell our children how God saved us. We should tell them what our life was like before we came to God, before we came to faith. Maybe we should even share how God has had to discipline us at times. We need to think creatively, how can we convey what God has meant to us in a way that they will understand and make sense out of? And so we should look for ways to, to help them see that God has a purpose for their lives. God has a purpose for, for every one of the lives of our children and for every one of you. And you are precious to God in the same way that Samuel was precious to Hannah. She didn't take him to the tabernacle lightly. She didn't pray that vow lightly. He was precious to her and we are precious to God. So that's true for each of you. God has a purpose for your life. He cares deeply for you. And so we want to offer you an invitation. If you would like to talk to somebody about God, if you'd like to study his word, if you just need somebody to talk to about life, we are here and we're available for that. And we would be thrilled to sit down and spend time with you. Now, before our time together is over, I'd like to ask you to go to God in prayer with me. Father God, thank you so much for the example of Hannah. Thank you for our mothers. God, for those of us who, who perhaps maybe didn't have a great example of a mother in our life. We pray, Lord, thanksgivings for, for, for others who stepped in and cared for us and showed us love. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to be a good father and that you'll help my wife to be a good mother and that we can express to our children how important you are to us and likewise how important we are to you. God, we lift all of these prayers up to you through Jesus' holy name. Amen.